welcome to the NMR Medical Webinar with Dr. Jay Balachandran of Columbia St. Mary's Hospital and Sleep Wellness Institute. Dr. Balachandran specializes in pulmonary, critical care, and sleep medicine. Audio cast quality is subject to your equipment, available bandwidth, and internet traffic. If you experience unsatisfactory audio quality, please use the telephone dial-in option provided in your confirmation and reminder emails. If you have called in, operator assistance is available by pressing zero pound. Or submit a chat message by clicking on the gray arrow and selecting operator. You may send questions at any time um, by using the Q&A window, which is located in the lower left corner of the presentation screen, right below the chat window. A question and answer session will follow the presentation. I'll turn the call over to our presenter, Dr. Balachandran. Please begin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, spend some time together and discuss how the Itamar uh, technology works. Um, for WatchPad, it's, uh, it's a phenomenal device that uh, I think has a lot of great promise for uh, sleep medicine diagnostics. Uh, so I, I work uh, currently in Milwaukee as a sleep pulmonologist. Uh, I was previously at the University of Chicago, uh, where we developed a really robust uh, portable monitoring program uh, that we're bringing here as well, but uh, the WatchPad was a large part of that, so I'm happy to speak from personal experience about this as well. So we'll cover a lot of things over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, starting with why we're even discussing portable sleep monitoring technology in the first place, and then walking you through what really is complex physiology uh, for how the PAT signal or the peripheral arterial tone signal works for the watch pad. But it really is quite elegant, and then you'll hopefully see by the end of the talk how we can use that uh, reliably to detect, detect sleep uh, breathing disorders. So, you know, why are we even talking about home sleep apnea testing? Well, all of you know that uh, OSA is a very prevalent uh, disease. On the left here, we've got the uh, sleep heart health uh, study cohorts. Uh, data from that showing us that the prevalence of sleep apnea is actually quite high uh, in the general population, certainly. But if you look at certain diseases that are of relevance to all of us, uh, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, quite a striking prevalence of sleep apnea, and not just any sleep apnea, but the kind of sleep apnea that you would want to treat for cardiovascular risk reduction. And in spite of knowing that that disease is out there, we continue to under-recognize and under-treat. Certainly the data um, from Vishesh Kapoor here is about 14 years old, but uh, it still does hold in my clinical experience that of the folks who we would ultimately want to catch, we are under-diagnosing them and under-treating them. Only about 13% uh, of those patients end up getting uh, adequately diagnosed and treated. So a lot of opportunity for this field. Uh, and why is it important that we're missing so many patients? Well, uh, many of you already know this, that heart uh, untreated sleep breathing disorders like sleep apnea have significant health consequences. This is just one slide of many I can show you uh, from the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort specifically uh, that untreated sleep apnea uh, is associated with uh, increased mortality, especially as your disease severity worsens. And certainly that uh, mortality is worse if you have folks who are untreated. So treatment disease itself and untreated disease are both relevant to us. Uh, I think we're slowly catching up, certainly, and whether this was financially driven or driven by an increased recognition of sleep disorders, we've seen an explosion in the number of sleep breathing disorder, uh, sleep diagnostic centers across the country, uh, certainly up until about 2010. Uh, and most of these uh, centers, as you know, uh, used in-lab polysomnography for the diagnosis of sleep breathing disorders. Uh, and it's a fantastic modality. Certainly, it gives you a lot of granularity. Uh, it gives you a wealth of information. And if you have anything other than straightforward OSA, it is your go-to uh, study of choice. Uh, and the benefit here is having an attended study that a technician can uh, monitor for other uh, diseases and even offer a titration uh, and certainly for folks who need more than just CPAP, uh, this, is, this is what you're looking at. The problem is for uncomplicated OSA, where we know we're going to need CPAP, uh, the in-lab study is significantly more expensive uh, 
than a home study. And in parallel with this, we have uh, out clinical outcomes data showing that for uncomplicated OSA, using a portable study as opposed to an in-lab study really does not offer any drop-off in terms of quality of care and quality of treatment. So between that comparative effectiveness data as well as this cost data, you sort of saw a tipping point uh, about eight years ago now where uh, the uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine published guidelines telling us that, okay, look, we have data now to say that portable monitoring studies might be reasonable to use for uncomplicated OSA. And then with the uh, cost savings in mind, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid put out a national coverage determination soon thereafter saying, all right, well, this makes sense. Let's reimburse for those studies. And uh, see if we can move the field towards that direction. So that's what you've really seen. Uh, compared to you know, the year before third-party insurers started to really embrace the CMS mo mindset, you saw that most of your uh, diagnostics for sleep were done in the lab. And I think we can all agree, uh, certainly this is more true in the New England area where uh, third-party insurers have really pushed this uh, more than other parts of the country. But even here in the Midwest, maybe not a 70-30 split like we see here, but we are seeing probably closer to a 50-50 split uh, with the in-lab versus the uh, home testing that we're doing. So certainly a big mindset shift. So if we know that portable monitoring testing is going to be an important part of the reality of sleep medicine diagnostics, I think it makes sense to find a device and a strategy that's gonna be good for you. Um, the typical home testing device is, as you see here, it's gonna have uh, usually a belt around the chest with a box attached to it, a nasal cannula, a pulse oximeter that's also capturing heart rate, and that box usually will, uh, the, be the belt of course measures effort and the belt, uh, the box itself can do snore and position. I think the operator or moderator's arrow key is on our screen right now, so I hope that's not too much of a distractor. Um, now, here's the problem with these traditional home sleep apnea testing uh, devices. Um, one of the big ones is that a traditional home testing device cannot distinguish whether your patient is asleep or awake. So take this example that I've got here. You've got a patient who took that device home. They wore it for nine hours. The device detected 27 overall events, and they got an overall respiratory event index of three per hour, which is less than, of course, the five an hour cutoff for OSA, so the third party uh, payer denies CPAP coverage. However, that same patient follows it up with an in-lab study, say it has 27 events uh, across the night, but the in-lab was able to tell you that the patient was only asleep for three hours, and now you have a markedly different index. And if this patient has significant cardiovascular disease or is excessively sleepy, you are gonna treat this mild OSA. So you can see here how knowing whether the patient is awake or asleep has significant implications for whether you're able to get coverage for therapy. And I've certainly seen that with some of the uh, traditional level three devices that we use for portable monitoring where we have an underdiagnosis and then it forces us to perform a repeat study uh, when the pretest probability is high, then patients don't like that inconvenience of having to follow up a negative home study with an in-lab study. So I think having a device that offers the ability to give you a sense for when the patient is asleep and perhaps then a more accurate index uh, is um, a way to go. So take home here is typical level three devices have a potential for underdiagnosis. And there are other factors that can lead to underdiagnosis, but that's the big one. All right, so we've covered uh, trends and problems and maybe outlined uh, where the limitation of home sleep apnea testing might be with the underdiagnosis. So let's pivot and start talking about how the WatchPAT sort of fits into this. Well, uh, it's, as you know, a portable sleep diagnostic system. Uh, it's very minimal, as you can see here, uh, incredibly accessible for patients to apply and use, uh, and the directions that are provided uh, for the device for patients is very easy to understand as well. So what do we have right now for the WatchPad? Well, we have a wrist-based device as opposed to an a chest-based device, and this device can uh, help uh, to measure uh, uh, actigraphy. So this is your typical device for differentiating sleep versus wake in and of itself, just a wrist actigraphy. And then with that goes a body and snore sensor that's applied with tape to the uh, patient's chest, very 
uh, minimal. I've had one of these myself. You barely notice it, and it's going to detect um, body position and has a snore sensor. And then finally, this is really where we're going to spend some time. Uh, this is your peripheral arterial tonometer, uh, or the PAT uh, probe, which gives you an assessment of uh, respiratory effort and also measures pulse oximetry. So how does that work? Uh, well, you know, in that minimal package comes many different uh, types of monitoring. We've sort of outlined these all, all together, and, and so let's boil it down. Um, but I guess before we get into exactly how that works, I want you to understand that the watch pad is not your typical level three monitor. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine designated four different ways to have a sleep diagnostic study, a level one study, and a level two study are your full monta or full PSG with full traditional EEG monitoring, uh, eye monitoring, chin monitoring, limb monitoring, and so on and so forth. Uh, level one is in the lab, level two is at home. Level four is your single or dual monitoring, so just pulse oximeter and heart rate. Uh, that's an overnight oximetry test. And then the traditional level three that you see depicted here uh, monitors at least four different aspects of sleep diagnostics, so heart rate, oximetry, effort, uh, um, and, um, and snore body position would be four different uh, aspects there. So that's your traditional level three. The watch pad technically is not directly measuring respiratory effort, so it actually has its own categoric designation, but in a 2010 study published by Nancy Collip, the uh, past president of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, she basically said in that sort of updated portable monitoring uh, review that this technology, while not traditionally level three, is just as good, and I'll show you data that it might be better. So um, the reason we've graphed this out here is that you see where things fall in terms of simplicity and comfort and granularity. Certainly the in-lab study gives you the greatest degree of granularity, but is the least comfortable for the patient. And a pulse oximeter, while incredibly comfortable, gives you the least amount of information and certainly is not currently reimbursable for as a sleep diagnostic and not accepted as a sleep diagnostic. And then you've got your level threes that fall in the middle. I would argue, and over the rest of the talk, I'll try to show you that the watch pad really does offer us more uh, granularity than uh, a, a typical level three device and gives you a significant degree of patient comfort. So let's talk about the PAT probe itself and the PAT signal. So this is what it is. Um, the PAT probe is a snug little device that basically uh, um, gives you a very sensitive indicator of the amount of blood volume in the fingertip. And it's so sensitive that it can measure changes in blood volume over a single heartbeat. So oh, it, during systole, when there's increased blood volume, you see an increased stroke uh, in the signal that the PAT captures. And during diastole, when blood empties out of the fingertip, you see a reduction. So it's analogous in some ways to the arterial waveform, but not quite the same. So uh, bottom line is very sensitive measure of arterial uh, blood volume in the fingertip. So why is that relevant to us? Well, as you see here, this is actually a very good reflection of sympathetic nervous system activity. So let's walk through this step by step. If a person has increased sympathetic tone all of a sudden, say from an obstructive respiratory event, the arterioles in the fingertip actually constrict um, from that uh, sympathetic surge. And when that happens, you actually have less blood entering the fingertip and less blood leaving. So an increase in sympathetic tone leads to vasoconstriction and a decrease in the blood volume change in the fingertip which would be reflected in a reduction in the amplitude of this PAT signal. So I hope that makes sense. Sympathetic tone increase leads to arteriolar vasoconstriction, which leads to a reduction in blood flow change in the fingertip and a reduction in the PAT amplitude. So using this physiologic principle, we can start to measure beat-to-beat -beat changes in sympathetic tone. And the fingertip is an ideal place to utilize this because it's highly vascular, uh, there's tremendous blood flow variability that is primarily sympathetic, uh, uh, primarily under sympathetic control. So uh, put another way, sympathetic changes systemically are gonna be highly reflected in the fingertip uh, vasoconstrict, uh, vasoconstriction. 
All right. So uh, let me. Uh, I'm going to come back to that point over the course of this talk, but let's now pivot to how the WatchPad uses the wrist monitor and that PAT signal to help us with sleep staging and sleep event detection. So how does the sleep staging work? Well, the wrist device itself is an actigraph that actually has a higher sampling rate than traditional wrist actigraphs. So it's going to be very sensitive, similar to a wrist device, for differentiating wake versus sleep. Now, beyond that, the uh, watchpad is actually able to distinguish between REM sleep and non-REM sleep, and then within non-REM sleep, differentiate between light and deep, which I would take light to be your stage one, stage two, and your deep to be more like your stage three. So um, uh, let's walk through that a little bit here. I think I've got something for you. Okay, perfect. So um, I haven't shown you the uh, actigraph signal here to help differentiate sleep versus wake, but this, you'll have to take my word for it, is an entire epoch of pure sleep. Uh, and what you've got here during light non-REM sleep is a large degree of PAT amplitude, uh, so high PAT amplitude with some pulse rate variability. So the uh, watch pad has already decided from a wrist actigraph standpoint that this patient is asleep, is asleep. And it says the PAT amplitude is high, so sympathetic tone must be low. But then there's a slight, there's a reasonable degree of variation in the heart rate here. So we must be having some sleep weight transitions here with overall low sympathetic tone. So I'm gonna call that light non-REM sleep. Contrast that with deep non-REM sleep where again, sympathetic tone is very low because the PAT amplitude is high, but look at the pulse rate. It's very consistent and there's very little variability, consistent with stage three sleep. So consolidated stage three sleep, good continuous low sympathetic tone and not much pulse rate variability. And an EEG here would show stage one, stage two, and those are your delta waves for stage three sleep. And then how do we distinguish REM sleep? Well, in REM sleep, we know that with dream content, you have higher sympathetic tone in general. So now, along with that, you've got vasoconstriction in the fingertip, so the PAT amplitude is smaller. So PAT amplitude is lower, and the PAT variability is lower, indicating higher sympathetic tone. But then look at the pulse rate. Because of dream content and what we know about sympathetic activity during REM sleep, we know that pulse rate variability is high there. So that's how the uh, watch pack can differentiate stages. Higher sympathetic tone with pulse rate variability is REM sleep. So it's a very elegant way that the watch pad's able to do that. And actually, five years ago, uh, I think this study holds up nicely. Uh, they did a very uh, nice concomitant uh, PSG and uh, watch pad study validating really good agreement, basically, of sleep versus wake with the actigraphy of the REM versus non-REM and the light versus uh, deep sleep. And what's unique about the watch pad, actually, in this case, is that, again, as I mentioned earlier, the actigraph actually samples movement at a higher frequency than your traditional wrist actigraph. So the ability for it to detect sleep versus wake is actually better uh, than a wrist actigraph. And that's particularly true of sleep apnea. Of course, sleep apnea is going to be a condition where there's sleep fragmentation all through the night. So actigraph um, agreement actually is, is poorer as your sleep apnea gets worse, and that's true regardless of any wrist device you're looking at. But the uh, watch pad performs better uh, than the other uh, wrist devices in this regard. In fact, this study showed us that there was actually uh, an 80% or better agreement for sleep staging um, with the watch pad compared to other devices. Well, why am I spending so much time telling you that the watch pad is good at distinguishing wake and sleep and REM and non-REM? Certainly the wake and sleep makes sense to you if, since I pointed out that typical home sleep apnea testing devices may underdiagnose sleep apnea, and now you've got a home-based device that'll give you a better sense for sleep time versus overall recording time, so perhaps better precision. But this REM versus non-REM is personally interesting to me, and it's an area of ongoing research. So over the last two years, actually, and most recently, a, a, an article in CHEST from just this past month, we have data that REM-specific sleep apnea may actually have unique health consequences beyond just OSA traditionally, that uh, REM-specific sleep disruption and sleep apnea affects our ability to consolidate memory, 
that uh, REM sleep apnea has effects on glycemic control, and that uh, untreated REM-specific OSA is associated with incident hypertension, which is really a, a novel finding there. So um, lots more to come, I think, in this burgeoning field. But another reason why you may want to go with the watch pad, because let's say, for example, that you've got a study that shows overall mild sleep apnea. The event index is, let's say, eight per hour. Well, that's mild sleep apnea, and your patient may be reluctant to start therapy if they're otherwise not particularly sleepy. Well, with the watch pad, if you're able to uh, see that the REM-specific index is 50 and the non-REM index is only 2, well, there might be some uh, research now to support that we might want to treat those patients a bit more aggressively uh, than we otherwise would have. So that's where I think this, this uh, can help us. All right, so we've talked about the PAT signal. We've talked about how it detects uh, stages of sleep. Let's talk about scoring uh, of respiratory events. So uh, this is really one of the uh, early studies for sleep apnea detection uh, with respiratory events. This was a unique model, very small study, only 10 patients uh, at, from Johns Hopkins, all of whom had sleep apnea on CPAP therapy and all of whom had uh, uh, at, uh, at least high mild, if not moderate, sleep apnea. The AHI was at least 10. So what they did is they knew that all of these patients had CPAP, so they had them on CPAP already, and then they did CPAP pressure drops. So you knew that you needed a CPAP of whatever to treat your sleep apnea, and then they would suddenly drop the CPAP at night to induce airflow obstruction to see what would happen to the PAT signal. So with very mild obstruction that might be subclinical and might not cause a hypopnea or a RERA, the PAT signal is not going to attenuate. There's not much of a sympathetic tone spike for mild obstruction that would be subclinical. But if you've got significant obstruction leading to either a hypopnea with a, an arousal or a hypopnea with hypoxemia, or in this case, a total apnea induced by a more profound pressure drop, now you start to see uh, a little bit of a uh, of a pressure drop, of an attenuation in the PAT signal right there. So now you've got some detection that the sympathetic tone rose when there was an event. And if that event is combined with a cortical arousal, you, you, sh you know, of course, that arousals of any cause cause sympathetic spikes. Then you've got the event with its sympathetic tone spike, and then you've got the arousal superimposed, and you've got a situation where the uh, PAT attenuation is much, much greater. So we have good validation from the sleep field that this uh, PAT device can actually detect uh, obstruction and arousals or respiratory events with, with or without arousals. And to put this into a different context, here we've got a nasal pressure flow with a PAT signal and then a continuous blood pressure monitor. And what you can see here is that during periods of obstruction, uh, of course, you've got a progressive increase in the PAT tone. And then, as you all know, I'm sorry, I, I, I've got it backwards because I got ahead of myself. During the airflow obstruction, uh, you've got progressively worsening hypoxemia and potentially hypercarbia. And at the termination of that event, as you all know, you have a spike in sympathetic tone. And that's when you see the PAT signal drop off. So you've got significant attenuation with the PAT signal as sympathetic tone spikes, and along with that, you see the blood pressure rise as well. And then the uh, sympathetic tone settles down, but unfortunately, we have another event. So at the termination of the event, increase in sympathetic tone and a blood pressure spike. So you can see here that the PAT spikes, or the PAT attenuation, rather, fits with the arousal, the termination of the event, and the spike in the blood pressure. So pretty good evidence, again, that this is correlating well with the event and the sympathetic tone spike that follows. All right, so let's look at that put together on an, in a PSG may, manner that may make more sense to some of you. So on, we've got a modified uh, PSG montage here with uh, eye movements, uh, heart rate, uh, sort of condensed EMG, uh, breathing, so this is uh, respiratory nasal flow, uh, chest movement, the PAT signal, the blood pressure, and so on. So we've got our apneas. Uh, we have some movement noise, which the PAT signal can detect, and it'll actually detect artifact time if that exceeds a certain threshold, so the watch pad's good at that. But then you can see over the course of every one of these apneas where there's significant hypoxemia, uh, where there's um, maybe some drops in effort, maybe not, 
uh, with or without effort, you've got certainly the hypoxemia and determination leading to a spike in PAD signal and a rise in blood pressure. So let's kind of look at the specific events that we would detect. Uh, here you've got a hybrid montage with the PAD signal, the amplitude, the pulse rate, the oximeter, wrist actigraph, and then on the bottom you've got your concomitant PSG, the nasal airflow, the abdominal belt. So as you can see, these are hypopneas. What we've got here are uh, events where we've got a 30% flow reduction, effort continues, and these particular hypopneas are associated with arousals. Note that in these particular events, these uh, are also having DSATs associated with them. So what happens to the PAT signal? Well, you've got a reduction in the PAT amplitude because sympathetic tone spikes. And note that also the heart rate spikes in conjunction with that. So this is what the watch pad is detecting. It's detecting the uh, reduction in the PAT amplitude and then associating that with a hypoxemia and calling that a respiratory event. Let's look at apneas. So here again, you've got a total cessation of airflow, some of which are terminated without arousals, some of which have arousals. Nonetheless, you have PAT amplitude reduction concomitant with the sympathetic spike. So the watch pad's gonna detect these events with or without the arousal. It's just that the arousal is gonna be more robust. All right, now, Take a look at this particular example. So this is a nice example of maybe a hypopnea or later on a rara. These have arousals associated with them, but in this example, there's actually not any hypoxemia occurring. Well, what you're still gonna see is that the PAT amplitude is gonna be reduced. So it's gonna detect hypopneas uh, that might be milder or raras, just respiratory effort that don't meet the detection, uh, the criteria for um, a hypopnea and it's gonna pick those up as uh, terminating with sympathetic tone spikes. And this is where you can begin to di differentiate milder hypopneas or raras from the more significant apneas and hypopneas because the watch path's gonna associate events that occur with DSATs and those that occur without DSATs, and I'm gonna show you how. Uh, before I get to that, we've got uh, uh, and a nice example that the watch pet's actually able to detect non-respiratory events as well. So here you've got uh, an actigraph showing sleep disruption and that disruption is being driven by leg movements. Well, lo and behold, that arousal is causing an attenuation in the pad amplitude because there's a rise in sympathetic tone from the arousal itself. So PLMs have the ability to cause, uh, to have watch pad detection. So this is how you're able to distinguish between the milder respiratory events and maybe PLMs. When the RDI detected by the PAT, which is basically any of the PAT events, so any of those PAT amplitude reductions per hour will give you that RDI, uh, exceeds the AHI, and here this is the apnea hypopnea index reported by the watch pad, which is all the PAT events that are associated with the DSAT. So you're able to get a better sense for the respiratory events that may have cardiovascular risk. And indeed we know from um, sleep heart health data that uh, events associated with a 4% DSAT may have more cardiovascular risk than otherwise. So you get that index, but then you get the RDI overall, which will just be all of the events, not necessarily associated with DSATs. So this will encompass the milder respiratory events, but it might also encompass uh, leg movements causing arousals and uh, sleep fragmentation from other causes. So what we used to teach our fellows at the UFC is when you did a watch pad study and your RDI was 60, but your AHI was two, well, you should be thinking about one of these other three factors rather than OSA. So it's a nice way to add a little bit of more granularity than just a single index. Uh, and it certainly is useful there. Okay, so um, you know, a few slides ago, I got, I got tripped up on my word because that was actually a nice example of central apnea detection. So it turns out that the watch pad, as it currently stands, is actually able to detect central apneas. So as you see here, again, on the watch pad overlaid with the sleep study, you'll see events that are clearly central apneas. There's an absence of flow and an absence of effort. Here, they're terminated with arousals, but they wouldn't have to be. And regardless, they cause a massive sympathetic spike at the termination of the event, uh, reflected by a decrease in the PAT amplitude. So central apnea detection is excellent with central uh, with the watch PAT. And here you've got a nice example of Shane Stokes' respiration, the waxing and waning, uh, and that's still going to be picked up. So um, as it currently stands, the current watch PAT device is able to pick these uh, uh, events up it simply will not be able to distinguish them as it currently stands. However, on the horizon, 
uh, is uh, a modification to the WatchPath device that's going to add that level of granularity. And the difference is all in this chest body sensor and snore mic. And with a change in how that snore, uh, body sensor works, we now have the ability to detect effort specifically and report central and obstructive events. So this will be coming. So basically, you've got the chest sensor that's able to detect whether or not there's effort. Um, and you've got your pad signal doing its usual thing. And then we've got our ability to detect F, uh, events. So let's go ahead to that. So here you go. Uh, you've got uh, a situation where you're now able to detect whether or not the chest is moving. You've got an absence of chest movement. The snore has disappeared. This, whatever it is, terminates in an arousal. It's got associated with a DSAT. And then following the event, you've got pad attenuation. So this would be scored as a central apnea. Contrast that, again, to remind you of an obstructive event. Here you've got continued snoring. The chest is uh, the new sensor will be able to detect ongoing movement. It terminates in an arousal. There's a DSAT, and there's a significant attenuation in the PAT signal. So we can distinguish now between obstructive and central events. So once we've got approval for that, we'll be rolling that out, and then you'll have your new device that's able to actually specifically report a central apnea index and obstructive index. As it stands, though, as it stands though our current watch pack can still detect all events. It's just not going to be able to spit them out as separate. So the current WatchPAT report, uh, as it looks, is, is this. And, I sh and for those of you who may not be familiar, the WatchPAT device would be uh, dispensed to the patient, returned the next morning, plugged into a, uh, a computer port, and then the data downloaded to uh, software that comes with the device. Uh, you can look at the raw data. You can actually uh, change artifact time if you'd like, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can, with the software, choose whether you want to reflect 3% DSATs or 4% DSATs for your hypopneas. Um, but you'll get, uh, at the end of it, a two-page report that looks like this. So in the upper left corner, you'll get the total recording time, and then you'll get the watch pad estimation of true sleep time and the percent of REM. Uh, you'll get your overview of indices, and notice again that you've got your overall uh, RDI, uh, I'm sorry, RDI, uh, overall AHI, and then the ODI, the Oxygen Desaturation Index, which, again, you can choose to be 3% or 4%. Um, the uh, reason that there's a difference between these two right now is that this particular ODI was set to a 4% ODI detection, so it was only going to report 4% oxygen desaturations, which, as you know, Medicare and Medicaid want to see. Uh, and then the AHI is set right now to detect 3% uh, hypopneas with 3% DSATs. So there's a discordance there. But this is a nice example of someone who certainly has severe OSA, where the AHI and the RDI match up quite nicely. And then you've got your REM and your non-REM indices to help distinguish between the two uh, for the REM-specific disease that we discussed earlier. Uh, you've also got your O2 desaturation statistics, so you can use this also um, uh, to help understand the degree of hypoxemia going on. The bottom of the first page is going to give you basically a hypnogram or a sleep summary. So you've got your PAT events, body position and snoring, and then your desaturations and pulse rate overlaid on top of each other with the overall uh, watch pad stage, sleep stage detection. So it's a nice way to, uh, oftentimes when I, we use this device, I would actually show patients this page. And it was a nice way to show them, well, look, you know, during this period, your oxygen desaturation is dropping profoundly, your heart rate's higher, uh, and so on and so forth. On the second page of the actual report, after the cover sheet, uh, you've got uh, in the upper part a uh, better breakdown of body position, so you can get a sense for positionality here. And this particular patient is having pretty significant sleep apnea regardless of the position. And then you've got um, some snore statistics. And then the bottom is just a graphical display of uh, sleep staging and the overall index. So um, with that in mind, how does the watch pad actually correlate real time to PSG? Well, um, from the 2011 study I brought up earlier, uh, there's an excellent correlation, as you can see here, uh, uh, between the RDI determined from an in-lab study versus concomitant watch pad. Uh, excellent agreement. And you can see that that agreement is excellent across all stages of sleep apnea. Uh, and then more recently, there was actually a meta-analysis published uh, in JAMA ENT, 
which showed that for the oxygen to saturation, excellent agreement with the watch pad and the homes uh, and the in lab study, and then with the overall RDI, overall excellent agreement. So, um, you know, for all degrees of sleep apnea severity, this is really a, a wonderful diagnostic tool. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to be seeing this data uh, published soon, but with that new chest body sensor that can uh, differentiate between centrals and obstructives, uh, we're going to, there's going to be data coming out with a fairly decent sample size here showing pretty, uh, very, very good, if not excellent, uh, detection of uh, Shane Stokes respiration and obstructive central differentiation. Uh, a question that comes up a lot for cardiology uh, um, focused members or audience members here uh, is whether or not a device that uses pulse rate variability and sympathetic tone variability would be valid in folks with an irregular heart rhythm. And there was a, a published abstract at the Atrial Fibrillation Symposium in Orlando in this past spring of uh, 54 patients who were known to have AFib who underwent uh, PSG and simultaneous watch pad. During the actual study night, 27 of those 54 actually had AFib episodes. So looking at those 27 patients specifically, there was still excellent agreement uh, between the uh, watch pad and the in-lab PSG for the AHI. And for the kind of sleep apnea that you really care about, the moderate to severe, really outstanding sensitivity and specificity in spite of AFib. You might think that with uh, significant arrhythmia, and certainly it is true that WatchPat will exclude data with when there's significant arrhythmia at night and call it not valid. But in folks with AFib, it turned out that it was actually only about 5% of the sleep time, and it didn't affect the overall test characteristics. So still a wonderful modality even in those patients. Well, you may be wondering if a, if a device uses sympathetic tone to diagnose respiratory events, what about medications that affect sympathetic tone? Uh, it turns out that the validation studies uh, for the WatchPAT actually included patients taking beta blockers like metoprolol, and that did not whatsoever affect the uh, detection. But as we said earlier, since the arterioles and the fingertips are primarily under alpha adrenergic control, it is certainly possible that uh, alpha adrenergic agents, whether antagonists or agonists, could have effects on the ability of the watch pad to detection, and they may reduce the sensitivity. But we actually use the watch pad at the University of Chicago in the inpatient setting, and in fact, we used it in the cardiac coronary care unit uh, for folks who were post-MI who had clear OSA, where the cardiologists were worried about untreated OSA contributing to reinfarction or slow recovery of EF. And it turned out that even in patients taking medications for uh, blood pressure or BPH or on medications for blood pressure or even in patients in mild shock that uh, the watch pad was still able to detect sleep apnea quite well. And what we told our fellows was, look, this, if anything, these agents are going to reduce your detection. So if you have a negative study in this case, you're still going to follow it up with an in-lab study. But if you get a positive study in spite of an agent that's going to reduce your detection, well, you're done and you've already justified treatment. And of course, short-acting nitrates are also uh, worth noting here. So, um, what's the? How do we take this technology and build it in? Well, we certainly have the traditional model of sleep apnea diagnosis and therapy, and it's still important for folks who either fail the home testing regimen or have complex sleep apnea. But we are definitely moving to uh, needing to be well built for a home testing model with a clinical evaluation leading to a home study. And then following that, you could either go to an in-lab titration if you were worried about complex sleep breathing disorder, but for routine sleep apnea, you could just go with an empiric auto CPAP prescription and then follow those patients closely in the first couple of weeks to get a download and then narrow or adjust the pressure range to uh, better treat those folks. And that ends up being significantly more cost effective. And now we've got lots of studies dating back to 2008 when the national coverage determination came out. And since then, that real-world, uh, you know, watch pad or other home sleep apnea testing devices followed by auto CPAP versus an in-lab followed by titration end up with exactly the same uh, uh, adherence and clinical outcomes. Uh, and then this is probably one of the best-known studies. This is the HomePath study, which was a multi-center study that was published, uh, I want to say, 2012, if memory serves me right. 
uh, but basically um, over 300 patients, which for sleep studies is pretty great, uh, really showed that the Epworth sleepiness was better between the two uh, and that CPAP adherence was great in both. It actually turns out that home regimens in this study were associated with better adherence, actually, uh, compared to in the lab algorithms. And the authors here speculated that just patients having the diagnosis at home and uh, the treatment facility uh, started without having to come into the lab may have just helped the sort of psychological and behavioral barriers that folks have to getting on board with treatment like this. So that's just food for your thought out there. Um, how do we use WatchPat, you know, with that model in mind? Well. Of course, as a home testing uh, uh, option, it's pretty wonderful when there's a high suspicion of sleep apnea, as you would for any home testing device. But again, because the watch pad's able to detect central events, you can still use it for folks where you might suspect a component of central sleep apnea. Uh, you might follow that up with an in-the-lab titration, uh, or you may go ahead with CPAP and just get a download to follow. But I think the watch pad stands out for its ability to give you uh, central event detection, although it's not going to break it out just yet until the new uh, body uh, device comes out. Uh, and then once you've used your watch pad to diagnose uh, and you've decided on a treatment, whether that treatment is CPAP or avoidance of back sleep or a, a mandibular advancement device, then you might actually wonder, especially with positional therapy and oral appliance, how effective it's being. And we've certainly used watch pad in those patients to actually uh, see if the positional therapy is good and see if the oral appliance is good. If you've got your patient who you know you're not going to get them into the lab, this is a fantastic option. And then I've alluded to the fact that at the University of Chicago, there's a very robust inpatient portable program that overwhelmingly uses the WatchPat device uh, for its diagnostics, and it's, it's, it's really convenient. I think the techs love it because it, you have to teach less to the patient, and there's less for the nurse to deal with. You know, there's not a... Um, uh, a band around the chest that's got to be sort of monitored. Um, the only caveat, and that caveat goes with any home sleep apnea testing uh, device, is that if you think your patient doesn't have the brain power or the manual dexterity to handle the instructions or physically apply the device, then you probably are going to steer them clear of this. And again, as I've said time and time again, if you suspect something other than OSA that's more complex um, and then you're worried that you're not going to be able to cut it. And here I would specifically note hypoventilation. Or if you have a suspicion for something that's not sleep disorder breathing at all, then you're going to want to put those patients in the lab. Um, so, so to sum it up, you know, I've presented a little bit of data, but it actually turns out that this particular device is the most studied home sleep apnea uh, testing device that's out there. It's highly correlated uh, to the PSG and several meta-analyses, lots of cost-benefit uh, savings, uh, and then there's good data that doing this in the home is not at all inferior to doing it in the lab. Um, and so I will stop there and happy to take questions. Typed in, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Bulachandran. Um, to submit any questions at all, please submit your questions in the Q&A window, which is located in the lower left corner of the presentation, right below the chat window. Uh, so there's a question that just came through, uh, if any manual scoring is needed. Uh, I've personally found that uh, I haven't needed to do any manually scoring. I certainly will inspect the raw data to make sure that the uh, um, uh, non-valid data is appropriately marked. But, you know, having worked with several different type 3 devices like the Nomad, the uh, ResMed, uh, 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 apnea link, and then the Alice Night One device, I certainly find that I have to pay attention to non-valid data a lot less. It feels like the watch pad is a lot better 
at denoting non-valid data uh, than those other devices. So I personally have not needed to do any uh, uh, manual scoring. The next, another question, what about a patient with poor circulation to the fingers? You know, I'm not sure that patients with things like Raynaud's phenomenon were studied. And I think it, even looking beyond sleep diagnostics, you know, this is a technology that's been used for over 20 years, actually, for cardiovascular research. And I don't think any of those studies included patients with things like Raynaud's. So my advice there would be to treat it like uh, a home sleep apnea testing device at all, which is to say that you could try the device, and if it's negative and your pretest probability is high, you're going to follow it up with an in-the-lab study. But people with cold fingers, uh, not going to be an issue. It's really just the specific issue with uh, Raynaud's phenomenon. How about another question, replying the finger sensor? So that is one potential bugaboo with the watch pad, but it's not a big one. The watch pad probe cannot be reapplied. So once it's put on, you know, it's a very sensitive, as you can imagine, detecting beat-by-beat beat differences in, um, in, in, in blood volume in the fingertip is a very sensitive issue. And um, um, pulling the probe off and reapplying it can actually lead to uh, uh, a, 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 a poor functioning of that probe. So uh, we instruct our patients very closely that once it's on, it's on. Uh, and so uh, it coming off will certainly affect the recording and make the remainder of the night potentially invalid. Um, you can talk to the reps that you're with in terms of the cost. Uh, and I think that cost is certainly something worth discussing. It's, it is real. They're, the probes do cost uh, uh, per probe, which means your device has an added cost per use. But, you know, um, a lot of programs, including uh, us at the U of Chicago, we pass that cost along to the patients, and many of them wide open were willing to accept that cost. Furthermore, I know that Watchpad and Itamar have um, programs for buying these probes in bulk. And actually, in talking about this with the chief tech at my lab now, you know, we have our techs doing manual review of our level three studies. We use the Alice and ResMed devices right now. And we have our, our sleep techs reviewing those uh, scoring, uh, automatic scoring and manually rescoring those for us. And you think about how much time it may take a sleep tech to have to manually score someone uh, and you wonder how much resource allocation you're putting towards that. And then you ask yourself if, at the end of the day, the cost of a probe to do these devices uh, and not have to do that kind of manual scoring might actually be uh, sleep lab savings. So I don't know that I have an answer, but I, I think that there's a good argument to be made that overall the cost of the probe might balance out when you factor in the other manual costs needed uh, for other level three devices. Okay, so um, another question. I have seen watch pad studies that don't detect REM sleep. Is it possible for an individual not to have REM sleep all night? Yes. So REM sleep, remember, first of all, is detected by increased sympathetic tone, detected by the PAT probe, and increased pulse rate variability. So right there, if a patient, for whatever reason, has you know medications that suppress pulse rate variability and suppress... Um, uh, sympathetic tone change, you may have a reduction in the ability of the watch pad to detect sleep stages, but not respiratory events. So event detection is still great, but sleep stage detection is certainly going to fall off when you have medications like that. But taking it a step further, yes, it is certainly true that patients for a number of reasons may not have REM sleep um, on a study night, and that can be medication related or otherwise. Okay, waiting to see if there's any other questions coming through. Okay, one more question came through. If a study is done in an inpatient setting, how is that reimbursed or billed? So that's a great question. It is not reimbursed. Uh, we bill it as a part of our sleep consultation. Uh, we had an inpatient sleep consultation service, but we made the argument as such. These are patients that would have never come to our sleep clinic otherwise. And by raising awareness amongst our cardiology and medicine colleagues, and by performing an expedient test and giving that service to our cardiologists, in particular, our electrophysiologists and our heart failure doctors who wanted to re decrease 30-day readmissions, uh, we were A, building that rapport with them and providing a great timely service, 
and B, building up an outpatient service for patients who would see us for initial consultation in the outpatient setting. So we sort of ate that cost but saw it as a plus, and it, it certainly helped us build our program. And I should say as a bit of a tangent, there is a very – there's a small study from Pennsylvania, I think, published in the last six months that inpatient diagnosis and treatment of sleep apnea among heart failure patients is associated with a decreased 30-day readmissions. So, you know, playing it together again, you're separating out a individual test cost from the overall system cost savings and improved capture of those patients. And I think that's a, uh, something we accepted happily. Uh, any difficulty staging recording of someone with a pacer or arrhythmias? Yes. So staging is certainly going to be impaired by anything that affects pulse rate variability. But again, we have good data that respiratory event detection is poor. So, you know, for your patients with uh, those issues, you're still going to get your sleep apnea detection. Uh, you just may not be able to tell them if they're having REM sleep or non-REM sleep as, as precisely perhaps. Uh, next question, does the patient know if the study is valid before returning the watch pad, meaning they, meaning they didn't appro apply the probe properly? What percentage of patients have, have, have a bad test needing to be redone, uh, i.e. breakage, et cetera? Um, so I don't think the watch pad currently would be able to tell you, but I'm going to have to punt that to the reps. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember being able to tell when we got a device returned that there was a problem at all except for patient report. Uh, in terms of percentage of bad tests, I'd be quoting the home sleep apnea testing literature, which says that overall there's about 11% failure rate of unattended home sleep apnea tests, meaning that if a patient takes it home, a little more than one in 10 times you're going to have a problem with some signal, uh, if not another. And that's, you know, perhaps more of an issue when you have a device where the patient has to apply the belt, they have to apply the oximeter and the nasal probe. Here it's just putting on a wrist device a finger thing and taping something to your chest. So uh, anecdotally, I can tell you we had not, I'd say, roughly speaking, probably a 5 to 10 percent failure rate with the watch pads that were oftentimes, most of the time, related to um, uh, the patient side, so inappropriately applying uh, the technology. Uh, okay, what else is coming up for a question? Can these be used on pediatric patients? Yes, in fact, the WatchPad just got approval for uh, pediatric detection, and there's emerging literature for these patients. I would say, though, that in the studies that have validated home sleep apnea testing, and so far I'm aware of three, uh, those patients all had adult phenotype OSA. So again, these are not your six-year-olds with large tonsils who are lean and hyperactive. These are your 16, 17-year-olds with obesity, maybe even diabetes, who are hypersomnolent. But yes, uh, and your tech, your reps will give you more info, but these actually are, the watchpad is now approved for use in pediatric populations. Is the probe one size? Good question. Uh, we only got one size, uh, but I only dealt with adults, so I can't answer that, I'll be honest. But, you know, you should know the probes are very, very snug. If you look at the inside of the probe, they are completely occlusive in the middle with like a, to put it in layman's terms, a balloon basically on either side that meets in the middle. So when you slip your finger in, regardless of the size, it's going to fit snugly around that. So, uh, you know, whether it's a skinny or a large finger, that probe ends up latching on fairly tightly. What about a patient on, an ox on oxygen, a hospital patient that they need to test? Well, this is a question that just speaks to home sleep apnea testing or in-lab testing in general. Uh, most sleep physicians would agree that if a patient requires uh, more than two liters of oxygen, you're going to limit your uh, airflow detection capability on an in-lab study uh, and a traditional level three. With any device in the home, any supplemental oxygen is going to remove that intermittent hypoxemia and potentially reduce the detection capability. So what we do as a practice is try to recommend either less than two liters of supplemental oxygen or ideally room air and accept uh, a night of relative hypoxemia with the upside of better detection. Certainly in our post-MI patients and heart failure patients, 
our cardiology colleagues wouldn't let us do that, so we just have that compromise of just one or two liters and, you know, put it in our consultation note that that's going to affect event detection a little bit, but we still get positive results. But that is definitely a caveat with any study. Waiting on any further questions now. I don't see anyone typing at the moment, so um, I think that was a fairly robust Q&A session. I, I'm going to turn it back to the moderator at this point, I guess. Thank you all for your attention, though. I really appreciate it, and great questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Balachandran. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's Itamar Medical Webinar. Thank you all for attending.